What's up, everybody? It's Marcus D'Angelo, and we're back for another episode of Everybody's Got a Pod. And of course, you know who I'm joined by. It's the Hall of Famer, the Million Dollar Man, Theodore Marvin DiBiase. Ted, how's it going? Uh, Marcus, how do you feel today? Ah, oh, man, I could not possibly hope to be better. I'm, I'm wondering how you're feeling, though, Ted. How are you? Well, I'll, to, to coin a phrase I heard somewhere, I feel like a million bucks. <laughs> that does sound familiar. That does sound familiar. Yeah, it does sound familiar, so... Ted, I have to say, I know that you have been keeping really busy as far as being on the road. You're doing tons of signings still. You're yeah. all over the map, my friend. I, 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 and you know what? <laughs> I don't have a weekend off between now and uh, the 1st of December. Holy every, smokes. Every weekend, I'm going. I'm going. I know that you're going to be in Chillicothe, Ohio sometime really soon. I know that you're going to be at WrestleCade here in November. So, man, you've got uh, you've got a lot of travel plans in your near future. But that's great, man, because I know that the fans always look forward to having an opportunity to spend a little time with you. Well, and, and you know, and, and, they, and I, I tell fans this all the time. I said, I said, I don't, I don't think the fans realize how much I enjoy it. I said because now it gives me an opportunity to ask them questions. Yes. What What did you like? You know, and what you know, and what you know, like what didn't you like? You know, like you know, in terms of you know, different programs that have been done in wrestling and things like that. But you know, it's like I tell you what, you you learn a lot just listening to the fans. You know, and quite no frankly, doubt. I think Vince should listen to him a little closer. <laughs> Hey man, whatever works. And I'll tell you what works here on the podcast, Ted. It's something that we've been doing uh, here on and off. It's it's something like once a month, every uh, third or fourth week, we do an Ask Ted Anything. Today is our fifth edition of it for our 20th episode of Everybody's Got a Pod today. Okay. And uh, boy, you put it out on your social media and your fans delivered big time. Tons of questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Okay. Uh, but I'm excited to get into it. Before we do, I do have to do my usual reminder to our listeners to get over to youtube.com slash at everybody's got a pod. Go get subscribed. We do giveaways for subscribers. We have clips and highlights from our show. And maybe most exciting, every Monday we drop a YouTube exclusive video. These are stories that you are not going to get on the podcast. You can only find them on YouTube. So if you like what we're doing here and you want a little bit more, you are going to love our channel. Again, it's youtube.com slash at everybody's got a pod. All right, Ted, first question this week. Francis Sheffield asks, what's the worst injury you've ever suffered in the ring? Uh, wow. Um, well, it's kind of like, uh, I, I guess like I've never broken them. Like I've never broken a bone you know, uh, or anything of that nature. I actually, um, I think, I think one time I did a spot where I, I had a guy in a turnbuckle and I said, I'm going to turnbuckle you and charge, you know, like I'm coming, coming down with my shoulder into you. And, and I just said, you just, and you get out of the way. Well, what I normally would do is I would go all the way through and, and take, take the shot on my shoulder with the, you know, you know, like the idea being he moved and now I hit my shoulder on the, on the ring post and now I'm selling my arm. Yeah. Well, I was just a little bit off and I went ding. Oh. <laughs> and I got this tooth right here. <laughs> Did you break it out? Uh, well, yeah, I, I broke it in half. You know, oh, God. I, I look like, <laughs> look like bang for a while. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you know, but it, you know, for me and for most guys, this is not a single injury, but it's something that developed over time. You know, I wrestled, I physically wrestled, you know, for almost 20 years. And, uh, and that's, and when you understand the nature of wrestling, uh, it's not like today. T today, all the talent wrestled maybe four days a week, mm -hmm. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Friday night, SmackDown. Saturday, Sunday on the road, uh, Monday night raw, and they go home. That wasn't the case when I was wrestling. It was every day, every day. 
No, there were no days off. You know, you, you know, what you your day off would be when you would you would get a, like a break, maybe you'd do a three three week tour, and then everybody goes home for a week. But you're not really going home for a week because the, your first day off, your first day off, you're spending half that day getting home. Mm -hmm. Your last day off, you're spending half that day getting to the next town you're going to. My goodness. So, yes, you're, you're really only off five full days a month. That, that was It was brutal. Anyway, back, back to the injury thing. Uh, I, I started feeling this, you know, this pain that it, would, it was generating like, it, you know, like down my shoulder and into the back of my arm. And I just couldn't figure out what it was. So when I went to the doctor... Uh, they did a MRI on my neck and I had, uh, herniated, uh, the, 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 the discs uh, between C5 and C6. Okay. <laughs> they had to, they had to take that out. And back then they replaced it with a, a with a, a chip from your, from, from your bone and in, in your, uh, in your hip. And, uh, now they replace it with something else. But back then, they still replaced it with a, a, a chip from your hip. And, um, and and that was it. You know, and there are several guys. I think, I think Jake, Jake's had this same thing done. Yes. There's been a lot of guys because that that's the thing is like the basic bump we take. And that's what the doctor told me. He says, you, you take you, your basic bump is from your feet to your back. Mm-hmm. You land flat. You you keep your head tucked so you don't knock yourself out. But all that weight is falling. The the most the, the majority of it is is, is because across the top of your shoulders and the back of your neck. And so uh, night after night after night after night, you know, and then eventually it, it herniated that disc, and uh, the rest is history. So next up, we've got Bert Seymour who asks if you can only choose one. Who's the better performer, Bret Hart or Shawn Michaels? This is a tough choice for a lot of folks. Wow. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to pick one because it, it's like when I when I think about Bret Hart, Bret Bret Hart is an unbelievable ring technician. But the guy who just has and always did have an unbelievable amount of charisma was, was Shawn Michaels. Yep. I mean, you know, he just did. He had it. Yeah, but I don't know. That's, that's really tough. Like, I don't think – I just don't think that I could, uh, you know, there's, there's so many things about both guys – uh, that are good. It's, it's it's almost like a toss up because, like, because uh, of, of what I just explained to you, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I but you know, I, I don't know. It's a tough choice, and look, it's I think that you can look at it in a couple of ways. Maybe the better uh, in ring technician, the guy who just knows the ins and outs, can get out of any situation, no matter the issue, is Bret Hart. Maybe the yeah. better performer, however, is Shawn Michaels because he he could get he could cut a great promo. Uh, he could captivate the audience with his kind of phenomenal moves. He knew how to, you know, kind of yeah. manipulate the crowd. So there's really, there's really a lot of uh, ways you could go on that one. Well, yeah, and 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 he did, cut, you know, he did cut good promos as well. Yep. You know, but I, I guess you know, and, and and again for the excitement, you know, uh, you know, again, you know, Brett was a great ring technician, but they're, you know, like. He wasn't that explosive type of guy like Sean, so maybe I'd have to, maybe maybe I'd have to give it to Sean by a hair. <laughs> yeah, you know it's uh, Road Dog. Brian James got in a little trouble online a little while ago. Well, not trouble, but fans started to come after him a little bit because he said uh, that he felt that he's a better sports entertainer than Bret Hart. He was like, "Let me clarify." He was like, "Bret Hart can work circles around me." He was like, "I can't work anywhere near as well as Bret Hart can." He was uh -huh. like, "But as far as being a sports entertainer, 
a guy who can come out there and cut a, a promo that captivates the audience and entertains the people consistently every single night. He was like, I think that I'm better. And I think there's an argument to be made there because, yeah. Ro- you know, a guy like Road Dog, he's got this over the top yeah. personality. He's really entertaining, but he's not anywhere close to being the, the technician that Brett is. So it's fascinating. It's, a, you yeah. know, it's a little column A, a little column B, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I would agree, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, me, uh, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I, that, that'd be interesting. You might do a sur- survey on that, uh, Marcus, you know, ask the fans, you know, it's like, what the, what did the million dollar man do better? Was he a better ring technician or he was, was he a better, uh, interviewer i like this we're gonna put this out on social media after this episode comes out and see exactly what everybody has to say about it i think that's a great idea yeah but bottom line is you know it's kind of like um uh seriously though yeah you you have to have both to be a, a you know uh and a lot of times and i don't know if the fans understand this but a lot of times the reason that a promoter will put a manager with a talent is because that that talent, whoever that wrestler is, he's really good in the ring, but he he he's the shits on the on the microphone. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, for guys that aren't great on the microphone, they give them a mouthpiece, you know. And so it's kind of like you know. And uh, who was the uh, who do you think the I, I was at the fans who was the greatest mouthpiece in the WWE ever? Got to be like a Bobby Heenan, right? Bingo. <laughs> 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 First one. Yeah. Bobby Heenan. I, I can't I can't think of anybody that did a better job than Bobby Heenan because he covered all the points. He he, he made you mad as hell. And he was very entertaining. Yes. And just well, so I mean, so quick witted, so able to like yeah. roll with the punches no matter what yeah. was said or what happened around him, he could make something of it. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. So to say who's a better performer, it's uh, you know, it's a good question, but I don't know that we can really get to the bottom of it. Yeah. Um Tin Soda asks, How'd you come up with the million dollar dream as a finisher? You weren't doing that before you arrived in the WWF, right? No, uh, it was kind of like, um, you know, I was a, uh, as a baby face, my finisher was figure four leg lock. Mm. And, you know, I would, I would, the way I went into it though, I, I did the, I would do the funks spinning toe hold okay. into yeah, like I'd go around and around and around on the leg, and then I would sit back into the figure four, and and that was my finish, you know. Um, you know, but it's kind of like when I got to WWE, and and I realized, you know, there's all these different, you know, there's there are some people you gotta you gotta think of something that you can do with everybody, right? You know, and I was like, there's you know. Uh, you know, you know, there's some guys, you know, you're not going to be able to, you know, like, there's no way I, for example, uh, I, of course, I never anticipated wrestling Andre, but there'd be no way to put the figure four on him. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, but I, I, you know, so, yeah, and I, it's a modified sleeper and, and, a, and a sleeper hole is pretty easy to put on anybody. Yes. And, uh, it's it's good because it's one of those holes where you can you can sell it and sell it like you're there you're there you're there and, and you start to sink and you and you raise your hand up and you're trying and the fans are if you're a baby face obviously and the fans are, are rooting for you to you know come out of it so yeah you can really build drama with something like yeah. that yeah. um i'm wondering though it's really similar to the cobra to the cobra clutch and yeah. slaughter was there using the cobra clutch as well was there ever any any issue there no, he didn't care that you were using the similar no, finisher. Uh, he didn't care. I didn't care. And as you know, he, he called his the Cobra Clutch, and I called mine the Million Dollar Dream. Amen. That works. 
That works. I know that in some territories or some places, like, you know, if you did the same finish as somebody and you came into their territory, then you had to stop using that finish, right? Yeah, yeah. well. Not in this case. This was this is post territory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got Matthew Brinks next, who asks, "Who is a guy that should have had a bigger career than he did?" Oh man! So we got to think of somebody who's like a really talented in ring performer, maybe even great on the mic, but just never quite caught on. Does anybody stick out for you? Well, I mean, I'll tell you one person who had 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 it all, and never and never really got a shot at it. That was Terry Taylor. Oh, okay. You know, um, I, I don't, I, I maybe, and I, I don't. I would say that, the, that Terry was like oozing with uh, charisma, but I mean, he was good on Mike. He was good in the ring. I mean, and he's one of the guys training the developmental group yeah. right now. So, I mean, obviously they think he's good. I, you know, Terry Taylor's one of those guys who I thought had, had pretty much had it all. Just never, never got a real big break. Yeah, he's a good worker, and you know, uh, Bill Watts clearly saw a lot in him because he did yeah. a lot with him in Mid South. But then I don't know. Uh, he came. He wound up coming into uh, the WWF, and he got saddled with that Red Rooster gimmick. Yeah, uh, Ted, when you saw the Red Rooster for the first time, did you think, "Hey, there's a there's a main eventer"? Uh, no, <laughs> I was like, I mean, I, I, I'm seriously, I was like, "Well, who 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 thought up that crap?" <laughs> it's pretty yeah. bad. It's pretty bad. And he would do like the cockadoodle do and like strut around like a rooster. And it's like, yeah, I don't know what we're doing here. It feels like we're intentionally trying to bury a guy. Yeah. And that might have been, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I asked, I asked Terry. I said, I said, I said, Terry said, you don't have any heat with Vince, do you? <laughs> <laughs> kind of seems like it. <laughs> must have done something to piss him off. Hey, but to, to, to his credit, he did the best he could with it. He gave it his best, and then he wound up going to WCW, and he kind of yeah. ripped off your gimmick when he was in WCW. Did you ever see that, the tailor-made man? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is funny. Uh, it wound up being their version of the Million Dollar Man, kind of. Yeah. Um, and actually, there's a related question here that I'll skip ahead to, uh, you know, because we're talking about guys getting stuck with, you know, bad gimmicks or bad creative coming in the door. Uh, Kurt Cuthree, I guess is how you say it, asks, what did Ted think about Dusty Rhodes being put in polka dots and the common man vignettes? So here's Dusty Rhodes, NWA legend, this guy who's established a huge, huge name for himself in Florida and with JCP. He comes in, and I believe it was 1989, and he gets put in polka dots, and he's plunging toilets, delivering pizzas in these vignettes. Ted, Ted, what did you think? Well, you know, once again, the first thought was, who does he have heat with? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, fun of a plumber. Now, now I am the plumber. <laughs> I mean, and and I mean, but yeah, I mean, I just thought I thought this was I thought it was an intentional, you know, like <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna see you and get rid of you. But I'm gonna tell you something. He made it work. Yes, he made it work. He did. And you know, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> We uh, we had a good we had a good run run man. I I had fun man, you know, doing promos about Sapphire. <laughs> and then of course you baited her over to your side with some money and uh, and yeah. then Dustin got involved and yeah that is that is some great stuff. I cannot wait for us to have yeah. a chance to talk about it. But no, Jake says the same thing because uh, I think that I asked him that question on one of our shows. And he was like, you know, it seemed like an intentional burial to me uh, yeah. for Dusty coming in. He was like, maybe yeah. because Dusty had had so much success with the competitor. He was like, but uh, Dusty came in and just nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a secret. You got to own whatever yeah. they give you and make it your own. And they yeah. did. 
Um, all right, next up we've got Paul Thirty Nurse O Seven. What? Why was your feud with the Big Boss Man cut so short? I was expecting a big match at SummerSlam 1990. Ted, do you have any memory of why that would have been cut short? No, I, 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 I couldn't tell you. I mean, uh, uh, um, I had not, you know, I had, I liked the big, you know, I liked the guy, the Big Boss Man. You know, there was, uh, I had no heat with him, or there was no ill will on either side of that. I. I just, I don't know. Maybe they didn't think it was going anywhere. He seemed like he made a better heel because he was such a big guy. Yeah. And he is such yeah. like an imposing figure for him to kind of be like, you know, all of a sudden go from being that guy, you know, who is, who is uh, coming after Hogan to being like, Hey, I'm just a friendly prison guard. It doesn't really work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that might've been it. I mean, you know, um, and, and somebody asked, uh, somebody's already asked this, at another time, they said, you know, was there ever any talk about the million dollar man turning baby face? Never. Can't be. Never. Because there's so much you could do with with that character. But the last thing you ever want to do is, uh, you know, turning baby face. No. I don't even know how you would after all like the, the bad <laughs> will you would spread <laughs> for so many years. It's like, how do you possibly turn things around for this guy? He's been so evil for so long. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, you'd have to start literally giving money away to fans, I guess that might work. <laughs> <laughs> Not might, maybe. Are you ready to perform with the confidence of the million dollar man in the bedroom? Are you ready to leave your partner feeling like a million bucks? Are you ready to get that thing so hard you couldn't turn the head with a pipe wrench? If the answer to those questions is yes, it's time for you to give Blue Chew a try. Blue Chew can help you increase your performance and regain that old confidence where it counts the most. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready when the opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. Forget about those visits to the doctor's office. Forget about the awkward conversations. And no more waiting in line at the pharmacy. BlueChew's tablets are made right here in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. But as we always say, there will be nothing discreet about your package. Men everywhere have never been more excited to see their mail carrier arrive because when your package has arrived, your package has arrived. Listen, I know what your next question is because it would be my next question. Will it actually work? Well, why don't you try it for free and find out for yourself? Something free from the Million Dollar Man? That's right. You can try it right now for free. All you have to do is pay $5 shipping. Place your order now and give your partner a very pleasant surprise. Women are attracted to confidence, and Blue Chew can help give you confidence where it counts the most. Don't wait any longer. Chew it and do it. Take advantage of our special deal. Again, you can try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code EGAP at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com, promo code EGAP to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring Everybody's Got a Pod. Uh, next up, we've got Reservoir Dogs uh, six seven eight who asks, "What's your honest opinion of Goldberg?" So, kind of a controversial figure over the years. Ted, uh, you got you were there with the company, maybe not present, but you were signed to the company during his rise. What did you think of Goldberg? Well, you know, uh, you know, just as a person, I have nothing against Goldberg. I don't, I don't know that he was ever, you know, ever worthy of the position he was given. Mm. I would I would put it this way. It's like, um, what was Goldberg already known for? Football. Football. And, you know, and so here's a guy who, who is very well known for his football talent. And we're going to, we're going to try to make a wrestling star out of that based on, on the celebrity he's already got from being a football player. Right. And I just don't know that it works. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I, 
don't have anything against the guy. I mean, and more power to him. You know, if, if you get a shot, take it. But, uh, you know, I just, you know, it's kind of like I don't, I don't see him as being – as far as wrestling goes, a, a great talent in, in, in any way. No, uh, you know, and that's that's always been the criticism of him is that he's not not only not a polished ring worker, but he's also kind of dangerous in the ring. Um, yeah. You know, like when he would hit people with that spear, especially early on, it was it looked like a shoot, which is why I think a lot of people were drawn to him because he would really, really tackle the hell out of people with that spear. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Starcade 1999, uh, he ended Bret Hart's career with a thrust kick that really connected, gave Bret a concussion, uh, which led to the, the end of his in-ring career. So that's kind of always been the big criticism of Goldberg. But, man, yeah. it, pretty captivating in the ring, right? Yeah, but, I mean, you know, you can be captivating, but it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the first rule of wrestling is uh, you take care of your opponent. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, it seems that, you know, of course, I never worked with the guy, you know, but uh, it's kind of like one potato, two potato, three potato, four. I said, you potato me, I'm going to potato you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you potato me once, okay, it, it, it slipped up. If it happens a second time, there's going to be a receipt and it's going to be a receipt you won't forget. You know, yep. uh, that's just... You know, and that's always been the that's been the business. You know, and if you don't like it, there's the door. So now, when you would nail somebody with a receipt, for the most part, was it pretty well like okay, okay, I understand, sort of a thing, or did you ever get into a situation where you'd hit somebody with a receipt and it would piss them off and it would turn into a, a situation? That never happened. Okay, no. so so most guys would own it, like okay, I yeah. potatoed you, I I deserve yeah. it. Yeah. Mark Mingo asks. Okay, what was uh, your favorite Million Dollar Man merch or toy? For me, it's got to be the LJN rubber action figure. What did you think, Ted? Did you have a favorite? <laughs> a, fa a, a favorite? A favorite action figure? <laughs> it's me. Like I don't, I don't really picture you like in your bathtub playing with them or anything like that. But, but uh, maybe like which one did you look at and okay. say, like, hey, that's that's one of the best. My ones. favorite action figure is the one that makes the most money. <laughs> that's and, the right answer. And that's not the million dollar man. That's a shoot. <laughs> <laughs> the one that makes the most money is the one that makes me the happiest. And uh, I don't know. They keep, you know, they. Th those Funko Pops, they just keep making them. Yep. I mean, there was, uh, I know they had one come out and then they, they, they had another one come out with me in the white, white and gold outfit. And that was like, they called the chase. Yep. Now there's two more. Yeah. They're That's, making more and yeah, they're, they're making, making more. more elite. Right? Keep them coming, baby. Absolutely. You yeah. know, not only uh, I'm sure you get royalties, but also it's something nice for your gimmick table. Now, if you, you pick up a few of them, you can put them on your sure. table. Yeah, them. yeah, it just works. Uh, but that's the correct answer. I tell everybody, I said, well, you know, at least I got the size of my head right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jay Andrews is up next. Uh, this is kind of a fun question. Do you have any good Dick Slater stories? Ted, it seems like everybody's got a Dick Slater story. You know, uh, I can't say that I really have a, a good Dick Slater story. I know that... I Slater was really, he was a good worker and, um, I met him on a tour in J going to Japan. And that's, that was my first, uh, you know, you know, uh, get to know Dick Slater and Dick was like me, a huge fan of Terry Funk. Hmm. And I would watch Slater work, and it was like watching Terry Funk work because he tried to copy a lot of Terry's mannerisms. Ah. That's something I noticed about him, you know. And uh, but no, I mean, uh, I, you know, I wasn't around. I wasn't around Slater too much in in the states, you know. And like I said, we we did a tour, maybe a couple of tours of Japan together. But yeah, nice guy. And, and a hell of a worker, you know. Uh, but uh, I don't, you know. 
so uh, rumor has it that he was one of the toughest dudes in the history of wrestling. Just a guy that everybody knew that you do not piss with. Um, did oh. you ever see that firsthand? I did, but I, you know, I heard that as well, you know. So, and uh, and of course, you know, I, you know, the, the relationship he had with Terry and, and that, that wasn't ever going to happen with between the two of us anyway. Right. I had heard, you know, like you know, Dick Slater could really go, and that doesn't mean he he's an am he's a wrestler with amateur background. It means he's a tough son of a bitch, and yep. he'll rock your world if you. If you if you don't you know if you choose to uh, piss him off, did you ever hear about the story with him and Sting? No. Okay, so rumor has it um, that Sting was maybe so Dick Slater is with Dark Journey um, uh, in real life. They had a they had a relationship, and rumor has it the Sting was maybe kind of sniffing around Dark Journey, so to speak, and uh, Slater took issue with it. And uh, Sting wound up with his head being shoved into a toilet. You've never heard this? Uh, no. <laughs> really? Yeah. So it's uh, crazy. So, so the, so, there's like one of those inside wrestler stories <laughs> that this inside wrestler never heard. <laughs> Jake, I talked to Jake about it a little bit. So apparently um, Murdoch was there too. And Sting at the time was tag teaming with a young Ultimate Warrior. And Murdoch had Warrior pinned against the wall so he couldn't interfere with any of it. And yep, uh, Slater wound up dunking Sting's head into uh, one of the toilets in the locker room. Wow. Yeah. So well, uh, I, 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 do, I do remember the arrival of the... Uh, uh, the idiot, the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate idiot. That's right. You know, he and he and uh, he and Sting basically they showed up together, and that was uh, that was for Bill Watts, I think. Yep they uh, they got their start in Jerry Jarrett's territory, and then I think they made their way over to Mid South um, yeah. as the Blade Runners, and uh, they that's were tag team. That's, that's what I remember is the, the Blade Runners. Now no, I know that I, I never became friends with the Warrior, but I ultimately did become very good friends with uh, uh, with Sting. With Sting, I've had the pleasure of being around Sting a few times, and he's always really kind and generous with his time, and is such a nice man. Uh, so again, I wasn't there. Obviously, I don't even think I was born yet when this allegedly happened. But that's always been kind of the uh, prevailing rumor over the years is that that's something that took place and just kind of yeah. reinforces the idea that maybe Dick Slater is not a guy that you want to mess around with. No. <laughs> or Dick Murdoch. Or I mean, so Dick yeah. Murdoch is not a physique guy, and if he's pinning the Ultimate Warrior up against the wall with all those muscles, that says something about Dick Dick Murdoch being a, a double tough son of a bitch. Oh yeah, you yeah, that's that's the other guy that you never want to screw around with. <laughs> yeah, I Man. mean, and Dickie was Dickie was good, you know, and he was not. Here's the other thing: I don't think Dick Murdoch personally. I don't think Dick Murdoch ever got the credit he should have gotten. As a, as a worker, he was one hell of a worker. And I think they were thinking about putting the, the world title on him at one time, the NWA world title. But Dick Dick is such, you don't ever know which guy is going to show up. <laughs> if the serious guy is going to show up or if the guy who wants to be a clown is going to show up and make you laugh your ass off. So I think that, that that's what hindered Dick from ever becoming the world champion. So. It makes me wonder, Ted, uh, you know, I did a stage show with Jake uh, not all that long ago at StarCast here. And one of the questions that it was actually a, uh, an employee backstage wanted us to address while we were on stage was uh, how Jake feels about comedy and wrestling. It's become a bigger thing um, as, as the years have gone by with characters like Orange Cassidy and Dan Housen. I know you probably aren't really aware of who those two guys are. But there's there's a lot of comedy in professional wrestling today. Kind of silly stuff, kind of breaking the fourth wall, breaking kayfabe, um, which, you know, of course, has been dead regardless for years. But still, a lot of people like to protect it where some guys are kind of being silly out there. What's your take on comedy and wrestling? Uh, I don't get it. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's again, it goes back to this, you know, uh, from the get-go, when you walk into a movie theater 
you know it's a movie. You know that what you're about to see is being acted out, and the characters are are fictional. You know, these are just really good actors, and if a really good actor is a really good actor, that he can draw you into his story. You know, and have you on the edge of your seat. He can make you laugh, make you cry. Well, guess what? In wrestling, it's the same thing. If the heel is really good at what he does, he knows how to turn your buttons and piss you off and and and, and make you want to hate him. Uh, and and so for me, you know, doing doing funny shit in a wrestling match isn't funny. Um, all right, Joe Alcom with a simple question, but maybe not quite as simple uh, as it would appear on the surface. Joe asks, who do you think is the greatest wrestler of all time? I mean, an easy question on, on the surface, but man, that's there's a lot of ground you can cover there, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you know, that's, you know, for me, I just, I, I, I can't pick one. I, I can't. There's. I, I can't say that. I can't say there's anybody that rises so far ahead and higher than everybody else. That, you know. Now I would say in the entertainment world, period, the greatest entertainer of any kind. You know, irregardless of of, of you know, it's kind of like you just entertainment. Yeah, whether he's a baseball player, football player, you know, singer, whatever, dancer, or whatever. The greatest entertainer of all time, the most popular entertainer of all time, was Elvis Presley. Yes. Hands down. I don't think anybody could argue with that. Uh, but, I mean, just to pick one wrestler, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I can't say there's any one wrestler that's had that much more exposure than the next or what, what have you um, at the top in terms of, you know, it's like, uh, uh, I would put Terry Funk up there. Yep. Uh, I would put uh, uh, Harley Race up there. Um, Those are great. Um Funk Jr., yeah, I mean, I put him up there, too. Um, now, if you go back to the 60s era, the you know, before everything just really broke out, uh, it, it, it was territorial. And that would be harder to, you know, that would be hard to, to pick. You know, in that era, uh, gosh... I mean, probably back in the 60s, I would have to believe that Bruno is probably considered the best of that era just because of his reach. You know, he Bruce, was. Yeah, Br- Br- Bruno, Bruno Sammartino. Uh, Luthez is another one. Yeah. Luthez was a great uh, NWA world champion. Um, hmm. Well, you know, I think that a lot of people, uh, you know, certainly nowadays, I hear a lot of fans say, like, okay, who's the greatest wrestler of all time? Most people seem to gravitate toward Ric Flair um, and say, well, his, his ring work, his persona, uh, the, his longevity, where today he's still, you know, considered one of the greatest. What, what's your take on that? Is Rick the greatest? Rick's certainly at the, at the top of the list, but, you know, here's the other thing. Uh, I know Rick. I love Rick, and, and you know Rick and I. You know we've had we we've, we've had a few matches, but you know the thing the thing that I think you know I didn't like about Rick is it's almost like if you saw him once, you saw him. Yeah. Because when you see him again, you're 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 you know you're you're going to see. The same match, or this, you know, all of the same things that he does in that match. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's like when you're the world champion, 
it's not real hard to go all over the all over the country and and have the same match with a different guy every night. If you know what I'm saying. I think that makes sense. And yeah, no, I, I know that you love Rick and you're you're close friends yeah. with him, and that's certainly not a knock on Rick. You know, he made no, an awful awesome. lot of money, an awful lot of money doing that stuff over and over again. However, you know, to your point, there was no, there was not a ton of variety with Rick Flair, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, and I think, you know, Rick probably and it, and, and it may be to his credit, too, because because people know the things that Rick do, they're anticipating him doing them. <laughs> <laughs> that's what rick has always well, said uh whenever somebody asks him about that he says like yeah. well look you know when your favorite musician comes to town you want them to play their that song that you, exactly you know, that you love yeah. he was like if yeah. they don't play that song you're disappointed yeah it's it's yeah. interesting it's uh it is it again is. You know, again so, I, I mean, again I, there no 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 knock on rick oh my gosh i mean definitely yeah you know in, in the top 10 absolutely hands down gotta be uh, uh gotta be Okay, guys, let's take a minute to discuss our partner and their product, which I will not start the day without. I'm talking about AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. You know, I used to start every day with a bunch of multivitamins to get myself where I needed to be, or even worse, mixing a healthy shake. The vitamins are expensive and annoying to have to remember, and to get the shake right, you've gotta go shopping and then get all the ingredients, and then after all that's done, you have to clean the blender, get around all those blades, and it just takes up a bunch of your valuable time. Well, nearly a year ago, I began drinking AG1 every day because I was fed up with my morning routine, and let me tell you guys, it has truly become a game changer for me. Now I have a single solution that supports my entire body and covers my nutritional bases every day. I wanted more energy. I wanted to make sure that my immune system was well supported, especially with my young daughter going to daycare every day and coming home with a bunch of germs. I wanted better gut health. I wanted a simple solution to incorporate into my daily routine that I enjoyed the taste of. Well, AG1 checked every single box. Here's the best part for me, guys. It's easy. My schedule is pretty much full every single day and AG1 made life easy for me by providing 75 high quality ingredients that give me key daily nutrients by simply mixing one small scoop with water. That's it. I drink it and I'm done. It's an easy micro habit that delivers macro results. Now I know what your next question must be because it would be my next question. How much does it cost? How about less than $3 a day? Break that habit of going to Starbucks or the gas station every day for some unhealthy breakfast that you don't need or some expensive specialty coffee. Spend less money and get a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients instead with AG1. Now that is what you call a win-win. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash E-G-A-P. That's drinkag1.com forward slash E-G-A-P. Check it out, and I know that you're going to love it like I do. Um, Don Skurlock is up next, and he asks, what was your first impression of The Undertaker when he debuted at Survivor Series 1990? Um, well, I mean, I, I thought the gimmick was great, but, I mean, it's like... Um... You know, my respect for the Undertaker came as as I continued to watch him and realized, you know, what he could do. And, and it's really hard to, you know, here's a guy that's you know, like he's supposed to be a dead man, right? Go back to life or whatever. So, you know, he doesn't move real, you know, <laughs> he doesn't move real fast. And it's like trying to do high spots in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> like the fact that that gimmick got over as well as it did. Like if somebody yeah. came to you, Ted, and they said, hey, I'm bringing in this guy. I want your opinion on him. Here's what we're going to do. He's going to be dead and he's not going to sell for anybody. He's going to do everything really slowly. He's going to be able to fucking summon lightning. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. like on the surface, you'd be like, hey, man, I don't think that that thing's going to work. But he worked. Oh, yeah, he did. Huge, huge. That's great. He's great, man. Love the guy. Yeah, that's another thing about about Mark is he's a good guy. Yes. You know, he's a good person. 
What do you think it was about Mark and his ability, like, to take a gimmick like that? Which, on the surface, like, man, there's there's probably only one guy uh, on the planet who could pull off that gimmick, and it's Mark Calloway. Like, what do you think it was that that made him so successful with with a gimmick that's kind of questionable on the surface? God only knows. <laughs> and so that's God why he's who he is. Because. Um, uh, I don't know. He just took to that. And uh, I have no idea. I mean, it's kind of like, had he not done that, I'm, I'm just wondering what, you know, what, who would Mark Calloway be? <laughs> right. what, where, would he have ever become a big wrestling star, but it had to have been for the Undertaker gimmick? Probably not, because it was just such an indelible kind of a, a look and yeah. a gimmick for him that, man, it's who knows? Who knows yeah. if he would have made it? Um, we'll do a few more and we'll get out of here, Ted. There's actually kind of a related question here uh, that I'll, I'll skip to. What did you think of the undertaker streak coming to an end at WrestleMania? Should it have happened? What did you think, Ted? Uh, personally, just because I, I, I know Mark and, and just how long, you know, and how, how, how much had been put into that, all the blood, sweat, and tears he put into it. You know, I, I, I didn't think the streak should stop. I thought it should have kept going. My own personal opinion. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Because it was just such a cool thing in wrestling. and such a unique thing. And then in one night, one fell swoop, a three count, and it's just done. It's over. Yeah. Um, and it's, man. And here's the other thing is I love Brock Lesnar. And, man, he'll go down as one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time however if you're gonna have the undertaker put somebody over at wrestlemania why have him put over a guy who's already so well established yeah i don't know it's interesting i don't know i don't know a uh, couple more and we're done uh tim asks did ted get to see much of the rocks work and what did he think of him ted the rock uh, wound up springing back up here in wwe uh this past week on smackdown and i mean an unbelievable reaction from the crowd whenever his music hit uh did you get to see much of his stuff when he was in his prime you know what i didn't and you know what's funny is i'm trying to think which 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 wrestlemania it was because I, you know, that's the only reason I was back. I was back because it was WrestleMania, and we were back in the back, and I, I, I was, I walked in the dressing room or something, you know, and then I looked up and I saw him, and he, we, you know, we, we spotted each other, and he smiled and came over and shook my hand, you know, and uh, I just, you know, he's just one of those guys that I, the whole time he was around, I wasn't anywhere around. I wasn't doing anything with the WWF or anybody else at that. At, at, when Rock, when Rock was in the WWF, became a star, got big. I wasn't there for any of it. Yeah, I mean, I know that whenever he would have started, you were in WCW, and then you know by the time that you had come back to the WWF to work behind the scenes, he was in Hollywood doing his thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but I, did I tell you the story? Now, this is this is Haku. Oh, okay. Okay. Haku and I are tremendous friends. When Haku first came in, his real name is Tonga. Tonga Fafita <laughs> is his real name. And he is legit from the island of Tonga. His father, I think it was his father, was like the tribal chief there. Wow. And... Where Tonga first went is he first went to Japan. And then Japan, the Japanese sent him over to the United States, you know, I got through the funks. And so I actually first met met him uh, in, in in Amarillo, Texas. And you know, again, he rode with me and all that other stuff. And, you know, I let him bunk with me and all that. And uh, uh, you see, he was just a real good guy, you know, you know, and, and Apparently that they had sent, they had sent like a, a, a thousand dollars with him from Japan, you know, to help him get started. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it either, it either was stolen or lost somewhere en route, the money. And so, uh, he, he, he landed in, in Amarillo without anything. So I just took him under wing and, uh, you know, of course back then, you know, he was, you know, he was just a young guy. 
you know, and he didn't like, you know, it's, it's kind of like, and so then, you know, that, whatever that was, that, that time period, I went somewhere, he went somewhere. And then I go to do, I go to do St. Louis wrestling, the, the TV. And, and, and so I'm walking down this corridor of the TV station in St. Louis and this, and this, and this great big guy goes walking by me and I just kind of looked up at him and I took two steps and my eyes went like this and I turned around and I said, Tonga. And he just looked back at me and got a big grin on his face. And he said, Hey Ted, how you doing? I said, what happened? <laughs> I mean, he just went, you know, he like turned into this monster. I mean, oh my gosh. And, uh, and I, I tell everybody else, I said, there's a guy, there's a guy you definitely don't want to piss off. <laughs> Because you talk about a guy who can be all by himself when he wants to be, it would be Tonga. Who man? Yeah, and uh, and so, uh, but this was a true story, and Tonga told me. You know, he said he says, you know, when when the Rock broke in, he says I kind of took him under wing, kind of. He says like kind of like you took me under wing. Mm. I, I showed that you know took kind of took care of him in 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 in, in certain ways. So all this time goes by and everything. And, uh, and so, uh, the rock drives up and he's, 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 he's driving a brand new Ford F-150 pickup truck. This is down in, I guess in Tampa. Is that where Tonga lives? I think he lives down there. I think so. A lot of the guys live in Tampa, a lot of the wrestlers anyway. So, uh, you know, uh, Tonga goes to the rock. He goes, Brother, he says, I like your new ride. And Rock looks at Tonga and goes, Brother, it ain't mine. And he says, Well, whose is it? And Rock tossed him the keys. Whoa. Gave him a brand, bought him a brand new pickup truck. And he says, Thank you for all you did for me. How about that? Yeah. So <laughs> as a as a rib, I said, Okay, Tonga. Where's my pickup truck? <laughs> <laughs> I knew where it was going before you even said it. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> uh, he just laughed. He just laughed. So you mentored him? Come on, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, we'll do one more, and I'll let you go, Ted. Michael Rowenbeck asks, did you and Virgil get along in real life? So, Ted, I included this one because, you know, you've spoke you've spoken nicely yeah. about Virgil here on the podcast uh, for the most part. Uh, but, you know, I've heard things over the years that maybe you guys didn't quite always get along. What can you tell us about your personal relationship with him? No, you know, we 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 did. We never had any, any problems. Um, Virgil and his real name, I guess, is Mike. Mm hmm. And I won't say his last name, but anyway, I know that he was from Pittsburgh and, and, uh, he was a real nice guy, you know, and, um, I think he had tried some wrestling. Uh, I guess the nicest way to say it is like, you know, uh, you know, the lights are on, but sometimes you don't, you're not sure anybody's home. Mm. Uh, you know, he's just not the brightest guy, but that, you know, I mean, so what, uh, he, you know, he did what he was hired to do. And I mean, that was, you know, and, and publicly, basically that's what Vince said. He said, you know, like we, we want to make the public believe as much as possible that Ted is this rich guy. And so you, you go with him, you know, you know, uh, in the airports, you open doors, get the bags, you know, you know, all that stuff, you know, that, that you would normally do if you were serving somebody now, and we, and we did that, but you know, you know, and even that wore off after a while, but again, uh, I never had any issues with, with Mike. This is, and, uh, uh, seemingly a, a good guy. I mean, he, you know, back then he took real good care of himself. I mean, stayed in, in tremendous shape, but just not a real sharp guy. You know, just not, you know, if, if he'd have had, you know, they, they did one little thing with me and him where I ended up having to wrestle him or something. And, uh, you know, but it, it didn't go anywhere because he just, he just doesn't have it, you know? Right. And he, had, can. he had this, he had, he had a tremendous look, 
You know, I mean, that's what he, and that, that with him, you know, with them big guns and his arms folded, you know, uh, you know, you know, he looked very menacing, but uh, he just, again, I, I like the guy. I, and I told him that I just saw him, at, I just saw him at a signing recently. Um, and, you know, he, he doesn't look good. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what he has and he never really talks about it. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, for a while I wasn't, I wasn't seen with him or promoters would ask because I started hearing, I, I started hearing stories that I didn't like, you know, stories about him being that like an autograph signing and, you know, uh, a little kid, comes up to his table or whatever. And, 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 and Virgil asks him, he's asked the kid, Hey kid, you want an autograph picture? And the kid goes, yeah. So he signs the autograph and then he says 20 bucks. Mm. And it's, and the kid goes, you know, you asked me if I wanted one. And I said, yes. He says, well, he says, it's not free. 20 bucks. Go get your daddy. Oh, wow. And, you know, and so I, and, and then I'd hear another story and another story. And what I think is it was just, uh, you know, I think a guy who had nothing else to do, uh, no other source of income and was trying to survive. Yes. You know, and I know, I know that, uh, the whole time we were together, it was my understanding that you now he lived at home with his mom and then, you know, but I, I, you know, apparently now that he's in poor health and everything, you know, I mean, my heart kind of goes out to the guy, you know, and who knows, uh, you know, maybe sometimes drastic things have to happen in a person's life for them to wake up. If you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And, uh, um, so I have, you know, there's a couple of guys that promote signings and stuff. I said, listen, anytime, um, uh, you know, I, I said, I'm going to be looking for bookings that are within striking distance of Pittsburgh. And I got this guy's number that takes care of him. And I said, I will call you. And if we can get Virgil on the show with me, you know, would you be willing to bring him? He said, definitely. You know, and that, I mean, that's all I can think to do to try to help him is to include him on some of the bookings that I have that are, you know, within reasonable distance of Pittsburgh. Man, that's that's awesome, Ted. And by the way, I you know, Chillicothe, Ohio. I don't I don't know what part of Ohio that Chillicothe's in, but maybe it's close enough to Pittsburgh that, that you guys can make that one work. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's later this month. I don't know. Yeah. But I think so. he might already be booked on it for all I know. But in any case, that's awesome that, that you're uh you're willing to, to help him out oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean uh yeah, I mean uh you know, Mike was a good guy. He just, you know, he never, never got in trouble and never, you know, if he did, you know, it's kind of like, uh, if he'd had real, any, any real wrestling talent, you know, we could have, gosh, the things I could have done with him. I mean, it, it was like, you know, here's this guy that's subservient to me for like years. Right. And then he finally gets tired of taking my shit. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, it, it, it could have been great, but unfortunately Mike just no he's just not equipped Ted that is going to be our final question for this week and right. uh, next week we're dropping back in on your time with WCW for a look back at September 1996 to close out the month here on the show so we're just going to take a look at the entire month of 1996 and your time in WCW during that period as a whole um, I love that period of time. I know that a lot of our listeners do because you would just start in with the NWO. So there's a, certainly plenty to <laughs> discuss. Uh, before we go, I, I want to remind you all that if you'd like to get this podcast early with no commercials and get access to a ton of sports, entertainment, and other shows, get over to PremierStreamingNetwork.com and sign up for Premier Plus. We're over there, and you can get our podcast early and commercial free. RVD has a podcast there with my brother Dominic. Efren does the game event over there. So if you're a wrestling fan or just a fan of sports in general, that is the spot for it. I guarantee you're going to like it. It's PremierStreamingNetwork.com. Sign up for Premier Plus today. If you're enjoying our show and you're listening on your podcast app, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review. It helps us out a bunch. 
Uh, and guys, we'll be at, we'll be back next week. But in the meantime, we would love to have you follow us on social media at Ted DiBiase Pod on all social media platforms. By the way, you can follow Ted himself at MDM Ted DiBiase on all of his social media. Follow me at Marcus P D'Angelo on X and follow Premier Streaming Network at Watch On Premier on X and at Premier Streaming Network on Instagram and Facebook. Ted, another our fifth edition of uh, Ask Ted Anything is in the books, and I had a blast today. Uh, me too. Had 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 a good time, and uh, look forward look forward to the next time, Marcus. Okay. Absolutely, I can't wait for it either, my friend. All right, and again, as I go, everybody, always remember this because it's never going to change. Everybody's got a price for the million dollar man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch you guys next time right here on Everybody's Got a Pod. <laughs>